Good morning. It's good to see everyone this morning. Think we're going to get some rain today? Wouldn't it be nice? Maybe we need to up our prayers a little bit on the rain thing. There is, I know there's a, there's something happening out there in the Gulf. Maybe, maybe it'll push some rain up here. Uh, you know, I want to welcome everyone, especially uh, any new visitors that we might have today. And uh, remind, just remind you, if you're a visitor, that uh, we have a visitor center as you walk out. It's on the right, that counter there. And if you would stop by after the service, then we have a, a gift we'd like to give you. And so please do that. Today is a little bit different format than usual. Uh, I have not prepared a sermon today. Uh, instead, we're doing a series for the next few weeks called Ask. Uh, you may notice that our walls transformed into question marks since you were last here. Uh, we're doing, what we're doing is any questions that you might have, uh, you can write those down and somebody, maybe Sandra, would you mind collecting any? Yeah, Sandra will, will, if you have questions, Sandra will get them and bring them up here to the front and I will do my best to answer them. Now, Notice I said, I'll do my best. The answer might be, I don't know. And if that's the case, that's the answer you'll get. Um, although I do promise that if there's one that I don't know the answer, I'll go research it and find an answer for you, if, if that's a po possibility. I want to start uh, this morning with a question that was left over from last week. And uh, the little person who asked the question was very disappointed that I didn't answer it, so I'm going to answer it today. Uh, that question was, what does Jesus look like? Or what did Jesus look like, is, was the way it was worded. What did Jesus look like? And that's a, that's a fair question, it's a good question. Uh, the real answer to that is, I don't know. Uh, however, there's some things that we can say some things that we can know about what did Jesus look like. Uh, the picture that you're looking at right up there at the screen uh, could be, that could be what Jesus would look like. Uh, in fact, you know, he, he would have had, he would have been dark complected, he would have had brown eyes, dark hair, uh, the average height at the time of Jesus for a man was five foot. So he'd have been about this tall. Yeah, about as tall as Jody back there. Um, so that was the average height. And we can assume that Jesus was a pretty average looking guy. And the reason we can assume that is because there's nothing in Scripture anywhere that talks about what did Jesus look like. Now we know that Paul had a big nose and that he was a short guy and he was kind of ugly, because that's written down, we know that. Um, but about Jesus, there's, there's nothing, he's just, so from that we assume that he didn't have any real outstanding physical characteristics. We can also assume that because Jesus came as an ordinary human being. Jesus is both 100% God and 100% human being. That's who Jesus is. And as an ordinary human being, he didn't stand out. You may, not, may remember when you read scriptures how um, the guards, the temple guards, were always looking for Jesus in the crowd and they could never find him. Why? Because he looked like every other Jewish man in that crowd. He wore the same clothes. He was about the same height. There just, there wasn't anything outstanding about the way Jesus looked. Um, I think it's good for us to remember that Jesus was not a fair-skinned, blonde-haired, blue-eyed person, uh, as he has often been depicted. I don't know if you've ever seen those doctors that would, they, uh, would paint pictures of Jesus wearing his wooden clogs with windmills in the background. Um, and he always looked so Dutch. Uh, <laughs> no, he didn't look like that. 
That's one answer to the question. Another answer to the question of what does Jesus look like is look around you. Look around you. Remember Jesus said, inasmuch as you have done this for the least of these, you have done it for me. Um, when you have Jesus in your heart, then in that sense, you are Jesus for the world. And so we can see Christ in each other. We, we see Christ in all of the acts of love and charity and the good deeds and the loving kindness that we see around us. That's Jesus. So that's what Jesus looks like. Uh, can you shed some more light on that? Of the physical description, so I guess that would be the first answer is I don't know. Yeah. But um, yeah, I think he... I think you answered that well. This is the person that always backs me and gives the right answer after I go on blabbering around for a while. Um, okay, we're going to address a couple other questions and then we'll get to these that were just handed in. Um, one question that came you know, through the uh, website this week was this. Somebody asked, <clears throat> they said, I, I, I know, I believe that I am saved by grace through faith. I'm paraphrasing this question a little bit. I'm saved by grace through faith, and it's not about anything I do. It's not about my works. It's about what God does. They said that. And then they said at the same time, but knowing that, I still feel like I'm not doing enough. Like I, like I need to do more to be able to please God. And why is that? Why, why do I always feel like I'm not enough? I'm just not enough. I need to do more. I need to be more. And I think, I think that question, but I think that's a question that probably a lot of us have struggled with throughout our lives and at various times in our lives, is just the, the sense of I am not enough. And I think that that, que that feeling comes you know, from the culture that we live in and from the way that we were raised. You know, even as small children, we were rewarded when we did good things and we were punished when we did bad things. Or we weren't even noticed unless we did something wrong and then that was what we got noticed for those kind of things. But, um, and then later on, it was, you know, if you got the A in school, if you performed well on the test, or if you were the best athlete. <clears throat> but everything that measures worth was based not on who we are, but on what we do. That's the way the world works. We get, we get judged, not for who we are, but for what we do. <clears throat> and because that is so ingrained in us, that's so ingrained in us, that we have to perform. We have to do better. We have to, everything we do is going to be judged, and we need to be better. That is so deeply ingrained in us that we project that onto God. We project it onto God. You know, we, we call God our Heavenly Father sometimes, or our, our, our Heavenly Parent, and we treat God like a parent. And I don't know about you, but I was always trying to please my father when I was a, when I was a boy growing up. <clears throat> that was my big goal, was to please my father. So then that gets transferred to God. And, but here's the thing. <clears throat> That's not how God loves us. God's love is absolutely, positively unconditional. Unconditional. God loves you. And not because of anything that you do. You cannot, you cannot do enough works to please God. And one of the reasons for that is that God's already pleased with you. 
God's already pleased with you. God is pleased with you because you are you. God created you, and God loves you. And I guess, you know, that's the real answer to that question. Why do I feel inadequate? Because I really have not fully accepted God's grace. Uh, and that's not a criticism. That's just, it's hard to, it's hard to do that. It's hard to, to put aside all of our conditioning, all of our culture, and just say, you know what? I don't have to do anything. God loves me exactly as I am. And when I do that, when I can, when I, in my healthier moments, when I can do that, then I can, I still want to do stuff. I, I want to uh, do things that are pleasing to God, I, and I want to love other people, and I want to serve. I want to do that, but I'm not doing it in order to please God. I'm doing it in response to what God has already done. Because God loves me, and because God has given me all of these gifts, and God has provided so well for me, because of that, then I want to do it. I want to, I want to do for others. I, I, want to, I want to love, I want to serve, I want to do those things. Not, it's a, it's a response to what God has done. Not because I want to please God. That's in my healthier moments. That was, uh, I, I would only add to that, Pastor Bob, um, that it does come from two places. From, um, and I get that, like you were saying, I think we all struggle with that, am I doing enough? Where am I in line with God's will? And am I wandering away? I think we're all looking for the path um, it does come from two places. It comes from the world and the, those bombardments from the culture, but I think it also comes from that deep love that we have, that his grace, his kindness um, humbles us. And I think when we recognize that, when we are able to shed away all the, all the expectations and all the, all the things that we think impress um, people, then we're able to come to a place of humility and say, thank you. And through that, I think we're inspired to want to do, they call it conviction, you know, by the Spirit, just to want to, to do, to do more for God's sake. You know, like Paul often mm -hmm. said, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he's a, he's a slave to the Lord, not to the world. To, to please man is, is to disregard mm -hmm. all the grace that we've been given. And, um, and so, yeah, I think um, I often like to remind myself, we don't have to pray. We don't have to come to church. We don't have to worship, but we get to. We get to. Mm -hmm. God doesn't say you have to because you have that choice. Right. So just the natural response is to worship him through service, through searching scripture, through prayer, through uh, interceding and, and, and just loving your neighbors. Right. And, and, and again, just to put a fine point on it, uh, what you do. don't beat yourself up. The world will take care of that for you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Don't beat yourself up. Yeah. Uh, what you do, do out of love and do out of that sense of conviction. Uh, and whatever you do, it's enough. God loves you. All right, moving on. Um, another question that I received was, it was an interesting question because it was a, a, a multi-faceted question, had lots of parts to it. Uh, the question was, uh, when Jesus comes again, will all of our busyness really matter? Uh, and then, for examples, they said, like the coffee bar, or taking attendance, or doing the things that we do, Shouldn't we, instead, be more focused on the altar rail and on prayer and those kinds of things? That's a little bit of a paraphrase. It was kind of a long question, but that get, captures the question. First, when Jesus comes again, our busyness 
won't matter one iota. That's not what Jesus will judge us on. Although he did say something. He did say something when he, he, on the day of judgment, he brings all the people before him and he separates them with the sheep on one side and the goats on another side. And he says, all of you on this side, you're cool. You're going to go to the reward that the Father has prepared for you since before the foundations of the world. Uh, and they said, why, Lord? And the answer was, you know what? I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. And I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you took care of me. And they said, when, Lord? When did we do all this? And he said, inasmuch as you have done it for the least of these, my children, you have done it for me. So it, this says that what we do is important. Everything that we do is important. Um, so the busyness, no. Jesus doesn't care if you're busy. I, I would say probably the opposite. Relax a little bit. The second part of that question sets up what I would call a false dichotomy. It's, it's saying, it's making an either or out of something that is a both and. So why do we have a coffee bar? Why in the world would a church serve coffee out there and have a coffee bar? Why would we do that busy work? Well, that's not busy work. 28 times in the Old Testament, we are told to welcome the stranger. To welcome the stranger. That's once in the Old Testament we're told to love our neighbor. 28 times. Welcome the stranger. That coffee bar is an act of welcoming. When someone comes in here and they're offered a cup of coffee, that coffee also leads to conversation, connection, and that is a, a very important way of saying, you belong here. You belong here. We want you to be here. This is your home. Feel comfortable. And I don't know about you, but when I, I drink coffee at home. So we offer it here. Why do we take attendance? Well, you know what? Attendance is a sign of spiritual health. And so we want to know who's coming. Someone doesn't show up for a while, we, we're going to be a little concerned and we're going to want to know what's happening. That's, you know, it's just important in that way. Yes, there's bean counters somewhere in New York that also we send in reports to every year and they, they put all the statistics together and put them on a website and never, they never get looked at again. But maybe that's a little busy work. But there's more to it than that. There's more to the attendance. So those things are important. The altar rail. Well, in the first place in the United Methodist Church, there's no altar. We don't have altars. We have a communion table. We don't have an altar. An altar is the place where Jesus is sacrificed. They have them in the Catholic Church. Um, and when they have mass, that they are reenacting the uh, sacrifice of Jesus every time they have, they have mass. That's, we don't do that. But we do have kneeling rails. And those kneeling rails, they're here. There's some nice pads there so your knees won't get tired. And they're there for you to use. Um, and we often invite people to come and to pray at the rail. So do we do altar calls? Not very often. Very, very rarely. Uh, you know where you are with Jesus. And uh, us calling you up here to make some public show of it is not going to change that relationship. Sorry, it's not. Um, if you feel called to the altar, come. If you feel called to the kneeling rail, come, pray. It's here, it's for you. Absolutely. Uh, as far as praying goes, um, for me, prayer isn't something added on. It's not something I have to remember, oh yeah, I'm supposed to pray. That's like saying I'm supposed to remember to say good morning to my wife when I wake up in the morning. Or good night to my wife when I go to bed. Or thank you when she does something nice for me. 
Nobody has to tell me to do that. I do it. I do the same thing with Jesus. When I wake up in the morning, I say, good morning, Jesus. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for another day on this side of the ground. That's a blessing. You know, and as I go through my day, I, I talk to him all the time. It's not something I do, it's my way of life. And I would hope that would be true for you as well. I would hope that you also would pray constantly. Because that's certainly what Jesus told us to do. Pray constantly. We also have prayer in more formal ways. We have our prayer chain. We send out daily prayer requests. And we ask people to pray. And we have a group of people who very faithfully do that praying. So, yeah, prayer is part of our life. Worship is part of our life. My, my point is, it's not either or. It's not, do we spend energy welcoming people or do we spend energy praying? We spend energy welcoming people and praying and worshiping and praying. We do it all. Because that's what God has told us to do. Very simple. I like how this question kind of ties into the previous question. Mm -hmm. um, for me, faith, we are, we are truly, we are saved by grace. We are saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. But that faith that we have is exercised in our obedience, in our, our listening, our looking, our paying attention to where God is and where he's sending us, where he's moving us to. Um, everything that we do, so like he was, like he was saying, everything that we do, is, if it's done in love, if it's done out of faith, it is an exercise of just walking this path, this path here on earth until, until we are with, with the Lord up in heaven. Um, I guess if I could use an example is sure. I think some of you have heard about last weekend, just minutes before the service, Pastor Bob asked me to come up here and, um, and answer some of these questions. And my, my human response was, oh, no, oh, no, 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 no. I, I can't do that. But the faith that I wanted to exercise, because faith needs exercising. And, and part of that is what we do when we serve others. But the faith, the Spirit said, yeah, you can do this. And who knows what you'll find and discover about God and about your people when you exercise that faith. So every bit of what we do, even the bean counters, if done in love, if done from a place of faith, and if done to please the Lord, is in fact good That's and good is yeah. grows you. Good answer. So here's one. Why does the Bible tell women to cover their hair in church? Well, you know, in the Jewish tradition, it was the man who had to cover their heads in church. So why does the Bible tell, say that women should cover their heads in church? It's because in that culture, uh, women were looked upon as sexual objects, not humans, not fully human. They were objects of men's desire. And because they were looked at as objects of men's desire, and hair was considered to be a sign of beauty and sexuality, then these poor men would be so distracted that they couldn't pray in church if the women had their hair down. I mean, I'm just being honest. Um, and fortunately, we've moved on a little bit. I'm not going to say a lot, but we've moved on a little bit since then to where we, we are more prone to look at people of the opposite gender as people first. And, you know, if you can't sit in church uh, without getting distracted by somebody's hair, we need to have a talk. <laughs> We need to have some counseling there and some talk. So, I mean, really, literally, that's the reason. Uh, in context, it was that Paul said that 
he was speaking to a church that was located in Corinth, which was a center for the worship of uh, one of the Greek goddesses, and temple prostitution was a big part of the worship of that goddess, and the w women were converting from there and coming into the Christian church and still wanting to ply their trade. And that didn't work. And so Paul, Paul's far away. He doesn't have time to sit down and talk with everybody. He writes them a letter. He says, cover your heads. Make it easy. That's all. Different context. Um, and that's the reason. You probably have a better reason. But... I, I don't, actually. <laughs> that is one of the questions that I have not yet resolved, except to say that for me individually is that when I read scripture, context always determines meaning. Sure. And so with each one of these questions that, that, we, that come about that regard uh, what was happening in that day, it's, it's always important to, you know, if you have, you know, to, to search that to search what was going on at that time. Who, were, who were they speaking to? Why were they saying that? And, and how is that applied to those of us who are on this side of the cross? Mm, good. All right, um, we have time for one more question. I'm gonna answer one more question here. Hopefully this will be a pretty quick one. It says, does Christian nationalism align with the teaching in the Bible? The answer is no, it does not. We are first citizens of the kingdom of God. And that is where our loyalty lies. We are citizens of the kingdom of God. And that kingdom is not defined by national boundaries or borders. It transcends all human boundaries. So whether you are Greek or Jew or male or female, or Scythian, or Mede, or Russian, or American, or Canadian, or African. None of that is a barrier to being a member of the kingdom of God. Therefore, Christian nationalism that says that somehow God prefers this nation over other nations is heresy. It's heresy. Not only does the Bible not align with it, the Bible denounces it. We are not special. And yet we are very special. We are special not because we are Americans, but because we are members of the kingdom of God. We are citizens in the kingdom of God. When we get these questions, I'm always thinking, what is the underlying question? What is the question that's not being asked there? And if the question is, as Christians, are we better than other people? I would say no, because God is no respecter of persons. He created all of people, and therefore he loves all people. And as Jesus prayed in the upper room, he desires that we would all be with him. And that, but that love is a choice. So to say that we're, we're better, stronger, or something else because we accepted the free gift of grace is uh, I don't think that aligns with, with God's will or with his love for all people. He desires all of us to be there, no matter where we come from. Thank you. Thanks for your questions. And um, uh, if I haven't gotten to your question yet, don't give up hope. Um, I'm, still, I'm still working through them and I've got two more weeks to get, in, to, get to your question. Uh, Again, if you're viewing online, you can, send, you can put your question in the comments and we'll get to it um, if we can. Or it, you, know, you can always text questions to me, email them, send them in through the website. There's lots of ways to get your questions in.